Welcome everyone and this is lecture 36 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. The lectures are based on my book manual Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find my book on Amazon. Please follow the link below. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. We are on Chapter 5, Hypomagnesemia and Hypermagnesemia. In this part, we are going to discuss hypermagnesemia. Now, when do we see hypermagnesemia? Okay, hypermagnesemia is kind of close to hyperkalemia. The main reason for hyperkalemia is what? Chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. Same thing here. Mainly, hypermagnesemia is a disease, is a condition that you see in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, the same as in hyperkalemia. Now, hypermagnesemia is much less common than hypomagnesemia. We see it when the GFR is below 10 to 30. So we are talking stage 4, stage 5 chronic kidney disease and patients on renal replacement therapy. Now, even then, even if patients have chronic kidney disease, stage 4, 5, or dialysis, they're unlikely to get severe hypermagnesemia unless, unless they take magnesium salts, usually as laxatives. Some patients are fond of magnesium citrate and especially magnesium hydroxide. Some still take antacids, aluminum magnesium hydroxide. So laxatives, antacids, plus advanced chronic kidney disease equals severe hypermagnesemia. Okay, so when do we get hypermagnesemia again? Chronic kidney disease plus exogenous magnesium intake. Now, because chronic kidney disease is more common in the elderly, then hypermagnesemia is going to be more common in the elderly. Now, patients on dialysis need to get their serum magnesium checked routinely, especially if they take magnesium carbonate. Now, usually in dialysis, in my dialysis patients, we check magnesium on a regular basis. And I can tell you whenever I see high magnesium, you ask the patient and usually they are taking milk of magnesia. So they are taking a magnesium salt as a laxative. Now, in some countries, not so much in the United States, they use magnesium carbonate as a phosphate binder. The same way here we use, say, sevalmer or calcium acetate. So if patients are on magnesium carbonate to bind phosphate, you have to check serum magnesium on a monthly basis. Now, you have to know that sodium picosulfate and magnesium citrate, this combination, is used as a bowel preparation agent. So if it's used in a patient with chronic kidney disease or on dialysis, you have to be careful and follow the magnesium. Like we alluded to in uh, the, the previous lecture, when we talked about preeclampsia, we are inducing hypermagnesemia in women with preeclampsia to prevent seizures. We said magnesium is the best seizure preventative medicine, okay, even though it's been around for over 50 years. So uh, nothing else is better than magnesium. Now, uh, if you have a pregnant lady and she starts to have hyperreflexia. This may signal impending eclampsia, so you may start to have seizures soon. So you have to start intravenous magnesium sulfate, bolus, then infusion immediately. How much? Well, watch just the, the previous lecture, okay? Now, some clinicians use normalization of hyperreflexia in women with preeclampsia as an indication of adequate seizure prophylaxis. So you are going quickly to check deep tendon reflexes. If you have hyperreflexia, this is bad. Start magnesium sulfate intravenously, then you keep checking. Once these reflexes are normalized, then probably now you have adequate seizure prophylaxis. Now, what happens if the reflexes now are absent? Well, maybe you have magnesium toxicity. So you want normal reflexia. You don't want absent reflexes, and God forbid, you don't want hyperreflexia. 
What about other causes of hypermagnesemia? Here we have milk alkali syndrome. Milk alkali syndrome is a cause of hypercalcemia because patients used to drink a lot of milk as a treatment for peptic ulcer disease. Now you see the same thing with antacids. So people can use a lot of calcium carbonate and that can cause hypercalcemia. If they're using antacids that have magnesium, then you're going to have hypermagnesemia. Now, hemolysis, tumor lysis syndrome, and rhabdomyolysis, they share the same thing. So you have cell destruction and then release of not just magnesium, of potassium as well. With diabetic ketoacidosis, you have insulin deficiency, and then you have hyperkalemia and hypermagnesemia. Once you start treatment, that is corrected. Lithium therapy is another rare cause of hypermagnesemia. Bone metastases can give you hypercalcemia, and hypermagnesemia, occasionally hypocalcemia. Other uncommon causes, familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia and Addison's disease. We have to keep in mind Epsom salt. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. It is 10% of, uh, of its weight is magnesium sulfate or elemental uh, magnesium. Bioavailability is only 4%. It's used for uh, wound care for humans and animals. Uh, some people use it to soak uh, their feet uh, if they are wounds, etc. And it's fine for this indication. Some use it as a laxative. That is not recommended because it could lead to hypermagnesium, especially if there's any degree of chronic kidney disease. It's definitely should not be used for weight loss or detoxification. Now, the clinical manifestations of hypermagnesemia depend on the level. Now, fortunately with magnesium, you have a wide, wide safety margin, not like with potassium. So magnesium from 2.7 up to 5, and 5 is high, usually you don't have any symptoms. So you don't need to do much. You just get rid of the magnesium source. Now, 5.1 to 7, you're going to have GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, maybe some dizziness, weakness, and the deep tendon reflexes are starting to diminish now. Now, 7 to 12, this is super high. You're going to get ileus, lethargy, blurred vision, sleepiness, urinary retention, confusion, and now you don't have any deep tendon reflexes. So if you have a lady with preeclampsia and you're infusing that magnesium, maybe turn off the drip and get a stat level, okay, if you don't have deep tendon reflexes. Above 12 is dialysis time. So here, uh, hopefully it's, it's not going to come to that, you're going to have flaccid paralysis, respiratory depression, apnea, low blood pressure, bradycardia, complete heart block, and it can progress to coma and cardiopulmonary arrest. I have to tell you, over many, many years of practicing nephrology and, and doing dialysis, I've never had to dialyze someone because of severe hypermagnesemia. How do we diagnose hypermagnesemia? Well, we measure serum magnesium. We need to suspect it in the appropriate clinical setting, like someone with advanced chronic kidney disease who's taking that Epsom salt for whatever bizarre reason. Now, the same way as in potassium, with hypokalemia, you do a 24-hour urine potassium to distinguish renal losses from GI losses. With hypomagnesemia, also you do a 24-hour urine magnesium to distinguish renal losses from GI losses. With hyperkalemia and hypermagnesemia, there's no point in doing urinary magnesium measurements, so don't do it. Okay, most of the magnesium in the serum is in the red blood cells, so like I just said, if you have hemolysis, you're going to get pseudohyperkalemia and pseudohypermagnesemia, so you repeat the test. EKG should be obtained in severe hypermagnesemia the same way you do with hyperkalemia or if you have any form of cardiac arrhythmias. Now, usually when we order magnesium, we've already ordered a basic chemistry panel, so we have our calcium, potassium, uh, phosphate, sodium, and this way we evaluate renal function and we know what's going on with the calcium and potassium. How do we treat hypermagnesemia? If, especially if it is mild, five or below, just stop the exogenous sources of magnesium. So someone on a magnesium drip will stop that except for preeclampsia. That's a special situation. And um, if, uh, if someone is on dialysis, you put them on dialysis and, and that's usually effective. 
Now, if GFR is over 60 and hypermagnesemia is mild, you just observe the patient. Remember that magnesium elimination half-life, if you're just waiting for the body to take care of it, is long. It's about 20 hours. So don't check magnesium every two hours. Check it on a daily basis. This is not the same when you have hypomagnesemia and you keep replacing. Here, you you're want the body to take care of the issue. If you have severe hypermagnesemia, 7 or above, 7 to uh, 12, 3 to 5 millimoles per liter, then you have to monitor the patient in a tele telemetry unit, and um, you actually may, may need to consider a dialysis if you have toxic manifestations. Now, the same way when you treat patients with hyperkalemia and arrhythmia, you give them calcium gluconate, um, you do it the same with hypermagnesemia. The difference here, calcium antagonizes magnesium. So if you have especially neurological manifestations, then calcium gluconate or calcium chloride is very helpful. So someone with a magnesium 7 or above, I, I would go ahead and give them calcium gluconate or calcium chloride, even though they don't have uh, arrhythmias. So calcium antagonizes the effect of magnesium, not just on myocardium, but on neuromuscular junction. With potassium, we said calcium antagonizes the effect of potassium on the myocardium. So only if we have EKG changes, we use calcium gluconate. Here, if you're having neuromuscular changes or cardiac arrhythmias, go ahead and use calcium gluconate. If you're not sure, use it. It's not going to hurt. And uh, I'm going to uh, stop here. This is all actually about hypermagnesemia. We are going to do some interesting cases next lecture. See you then.